Well, good evening, everybody. Welcome along to the RTN online Bible study once again. It's Wednesday evening, and we're here with Jacob Prash with a new series this evening, which may take us over three or four weeks. We're looking at Elijah. And as many of you know, Elijah is one of those figures who's mentioned so many times in other books, the books of Kings, and various other books in the Bible, where he's known as Elijah, Eliehu, or even in the Greek form, as we'd say today, Elias. A character who has inspired us, who showed us the faithfulness of God in, in many ways. And one of the things which we know is that there will be, alas, there will be Elijah in the end times. My God is Yahweh is what his name means. But where does that actually take us tonight? Well, I suspect over the next two or three weeks, we'll be delving into this pretty deeply. And some of the narrative, some of the stories that we have accepted in relation to Elijah may become a little bit more of a reality by the time Jacob is finished. I don't know where he's going exactly with it, but I have a rough idea. So I'm going to hand over to Marco Quintana. Marco, are you there, good buddy? I'm here, Amos. How are, how are you? How's everybody? We're good. Marco, as many of you may know, is from DeVore Church in California, in, uh, of course, America. And he's a uh, member of the RTN board and also with Moriel. I'm just going to ask Mark if you just bless us with an opening prayer this evening. Good evening, Marco. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, everyone. Jacob, how are you tonight? Muy bien, gracias. ¿Y tú? Gracias a Dios. Gloria al Señor. So let's pray and ask the Lord for his blessings. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this evening. We thank you for this morning and different time zones that we carry. Lord, you hear our prayers the same. And we pray, Father God, that you bless us with your presence this, uh, this morning, this afternoon, uh, through your word. And by your spirit, you would teach us how to walk with you closer, how to be in relationship with you, Lord. Bless my brother Jacob, Lord, with insight and knowledge of the scripture that you give him through your spirit, Lord. Help his time of studying, Lord, be profitable and bear fruit. Uh, Lord, we pray that our hearts will be ready to receive the seed, the seed of your word. Let it go down deep into our spirit, Lord, and let it bear much fruit. We praise you and thank you, Lord, in the days that we live, Lord, we uh, need more of your word to strengthen us, to encourage us, to empower us, to go forward and to live the life of Jesus before people's lives so they would see you, Lord, and glorify the Father. We pray, Lord God, you fill us with your spirit, your love, and your truth, Lord. Forgive our sins, Lord God, as we may have neglected your word this week or may not have been close to you this week, Lord God, but we draw near today, and you promise, Lord, you will draw near to us. So we thank you for the study. May it bear much fruit in people's lives uh, as it is right now live, but Lord, also those who will hear it later and will get a hold of it later. May your spirit lead those people to this study. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Amen. Thank you, the Lord thank you Marco. Well, good evening once again to everybody who's tuning in on the live stream, either on RTN Direct or, of course, from Moriel TV. Thank you for joining us. This really has become... A real pleasure and it's a real blessing for those of us who put this together to find that so many people are appreciating the, the, the message and the teaching from Jacob. It's a real encouragement to us. So we do thank you for spreading the word amongst your friends, your family, and anyone who needs to hear the truth. Tonight we're looking at Elijah. Jacob has taken us through a mini-series looking at Elijah. And one of the things we all recognize, certainly from the book of Malachi, is that Elijah or someone in the form of Elijah is coming back again. I'm going to hand you over to Jacob as we'll develop this thought and this theme, looking at the history of Elijah and, of course, the recapitulation of Elijah in the end times as well. I'm sure we'll get there. So thank you very much. At the end of the program, we'll take your questions, and I'll unmute your microphones to allow you to do that. So just keep your microphones on mute during the program. Otherwise, it does just become a cacophony, and it's very difficult to follow. But bless you all. hope you are certainly wiser by the end of this program and more qualified and more able to stand the test and the world and all its ways as we get darker and darker and we head towards the Lord's return. Jacob, over to you, brother. Thank you so much. Greetings in Jesus, everyone. I know you're from several countries and different time zones, so we'll do our absolute best with the help of the Lord. Let's begin to understand certain things. When you have a jigsaw puzzle, one of those thousand piece jigsaw puzzles and pretend that the picture of what it looks like when it's completed is not on the, on the box. You just open the box and there's the pieces. You've got quite a 
situation to deal with when there's a thousand pieces and certain things appear to fit together, but then they don't. And it's a meticulous painstaking process. But the people who do these puzzles a lot, who are good at it, they do it for a hobby. Um, some people find it very relaxing. Other people find it nerve wracking. It's not for everybody, but the people who tend to be good at it. And by good, I mean, they can complete the puzzle in the fastest amount of time. One of the things they tend to do is they get the periphery. They get the framework right. Once they get the framework right, they can put other things in place. Now, of course, they have an advantage. They've seen the picture on the box. We have not seen a picture on the box. What we have is a description, a description about what is going to happen, why it's going to happen, and to a degree, how it is going to happen. We have a verbal or an oral description. We don't have a picture. So we have to work from an oral presentation or, or written, but not visual. <clears throat> this becomes problematic in itself. Uh, unless we are led by the Holy Spirit, it's going to be very frustrating to get anywhere. Additionally, when we look at some of the apocalyptic literature and scripture, particularly the book of Revelation. Most people overlook the fact, except for some scholars, that it is nearly as audiophonic as it is visual. It's nearly as audiophonic. You see the repeated phrase, and then I heard, then I heard, then I heard. We're used to looking at things with our eyes while the text is telling us to listen, to hear for certain things. This is a very different approach than most people would have to looking at some kind of a puzzle. So we hear the description, we hear this, and then we have to see it with our eyes progressively. Now remember, the scripture is a progressive revelation concerning the end of the age and the return of Jesus. My apologies to those who know this. As we've said many times, the word apocalypse in Greek, apocalypsis, is I have a picture here from the Song of Solomon, Asher Shirim. The curtain goes up. It is an unveiling. It gets clearer and clearer as we get closer and closer to the return of Jesus. But it doesn't get clearer for everyone. For some people, those who are in Christ, it goes up. For the apostate church and the world, it goes down. They see less and less and less. We see this now in many respects. But turn with me, first of all, to Daniel chapter 12. Daniel 12, as we construct our background to begin looking at the subject for this evening. Daniel is told to seal these things up, okay, to seal these things up. And we are told in Daniel chapter 12 that none of the wicked are going to understand. Many will be purged, purified, and refined, but the wicked will act wickedly, and none of the wicked will understand. Those who have insights will understand. It is only those who have insight that will understand. We see this in the same chapter, 12 and verse 3. Those who have insight will shine brightly. Now, this relates back to what prefigures it and teaches about it, the story of the Maccabees that is predicted in chapter 11. We won't go there now. We've looked at it before. But notice that the wicked, they just won't get it. Let's begin at the beginning of the chapter. Now, at that time, Michael, the great prince, who stands guard over the sons of your people, that's to do with Israel, will arise, and there will be a time of distress such as never occurred since there was a nation until that time. And at that time, your people, everyone who was found written in the book of life will be rescued. Now, just look at that, that very brief passage. 
we are told that something is going to happen at the end of the age that is going to involve Israel as well as the church to a degree, well, or to or believers to a degree. The church won't actually exist as such. It'll just be believers. It will not be anything more than a collection of individuals. It will not be a, a united body. But that's a separate subject. Before the Lord comes, the power of the holy people is shaken. Yet Satan will turn his attention to the destruction of the Jews once the faithful believers are rescued. So nothing this bad has ever happened before, and nothing this bad is going to happen again, says Daniel. Jesus picks up on it. He says the same thing in the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24. He says directly the same exact thing. When this megathalipson, when this great tribulation happens, nothing like this has ever happened before, nor will anything like it happen again. Now he tells us in verses uh, 7 and 8, don't be frightened, don't be afraid. We're not to be afraid of these things. More about that in a moment. And we're told many are going to fall away. We're told all of these things, but it's going to happen. And he says, nothing this bad has ever happened before. Nothing this bad has ever happened before, nor will anything this bad happen again. Jesus and Daniel both tell us something unique is going to happen at the time of rescue, that is the rapture. There are people who are given to something known as hyperpreterism. They will try to tell you that it was all fulfilled in 70 AD and has no future meaning. In fact, as we know, there was a partial fulfillment in 70 AD. But worse things have happened both to the church and to Israel and the Jews since 70 AD. The Holocaust of the 1930s and 40s the second rebellion in the second century under Bar Kokhba, worse things happened to the Jews than 70 AD, and worse things have happened to the church than 70 AD throughout history. Um, so it, it's impossible for it to have happened then with no future meaning. However, what did happen then gives us a outline of what's going to happen. It's a microcosm of the future. We've explained these things before. The rescue of the believers from Jerusalem in 70 AD under Simeon, Jesus' cousin, is one of the things that prefigure the rapture. We deal with this in the book um, Harpezo, Harpezo. Nonetheless, let's look further at this. So, the faithful believers are going to understand the harlot church will not understand. The world will not understand. Unbelieving Israel will not understand. Only the faithful church, composed of Jews and non-Jews who are born again and who are truly trusting Jesus, Jesus tells them, when you see this thing happening, don't be frightened. The world is going to freak out. I'm on a lockdown in England. People are beginning to freak out already. They've never seen anything quite like this since the Second World War with these kinds of restrictions. Um, Australia is similar. Uh, certain states in America are no better. Uh, when you see the cities of, of, of Tokyo, and well, certainly New York and London, almost empty compared to what they normally are. Would, this is only a hint of what's coming. Expect unsaved people to be afraid, frightened. Expect the world to be frightened. That's what's, they're going to be afraid. Secondly, let's understand what else it's saying. There will be a rescue. There will be a rescue. The Olivet Discourse, Daniel 12, there will be a rescue. 
Now, this is the subject of the rapture, of course. That's not our main subject this evening. It will be in perhaps two weeks. Okay, there will be a rescue. Now, what's frightening is people don't understand what's happening. We have to understand what Jesus meant and what the apostles meant for their own time, how these things apply to their own time, such as 70 AD and the siege of Jerusalem recorded by Josephus, it predicted by Daniel and Jesus, and it happened. Okay, we have to understand that. That is part of the frame. What's going to happen will fit into the frame of what has already happened. What has already happened is always a microcosm of what is going to happen. There are many things like this in Scripture. The rescue of Lot and his family, a type of the rapture. The rescue of Noah and his family, a type of the rapture. As we pointed out many times, the exodus of the Jews from Israel, the Israelites, a type of the rapture. There are many things that prefigure what's going to happen. Okay. What is going to happen will always take place within the framework of what did happen. There is a pattern. There is a pattern. There will be differences in the last days and things like magnitude, but it will always follow the same pattern. Get the frame right. Well, let's go to the New Testament. The New Testament, beginning with the Gospels, we have the teaching of the Olivet Discourse. It's a teaching that Jesus gave shortly before he was going to be betrayed and crucified. That is unique in itself. The point in his ministry when he gave it is important in itself and teaches something about the end of the age. As Jesus was betrayed, we are going to be betrayed. Many will fall away and betray one another. Okay, um, What happened to him is going to happen to us, to the church. That's not to say every believer is going to be crucified, but as the body itself, the body of Christ, is going to face a terrible persecution under Antichrist. It'll be much in harmony with what happened to the early church under the Roman emperors. It'll be in harmony with what Mao did to Christians, what Stalin did to Christians. Again, part of our problem is in the Protestant democracies, we've taken our freedom for granted. Now it's disappearing, isn't it? Well, let's go further with this. So, we think of the Olivet Discourse. However, it's not that simple. Mark's Gospel is probably the Gospel of Peter dictated to Mark. It's called Mark and Priority, and it's probably the first gospel written. In fact, it almost certainly is. But it is most likely the account of Peter. Most likely the account of Peter. It has Mark 13, Mark's version of the Olivet Discourse. Luke, however, is quite different. In Luke, you've got it in chapter 21. But then you have elements of it in Luke chapter 17, Luke chapter 11. Uh, it's fragmented in such a way as Jesus says the same things over and over, but each time he says it, he highlights a different aspect. What I'm saying is the Olivet Discourse must be read synoptically. Don't just read Matthew 24. Don't just read Mark 13. We have to read them all in light of each other. Secondly, remember that Matthew and Luke 
have multiple accounts, not of the discourse itself, but of the teaching in the discourse. For instance, we all think of the Sermon on the Mount. But Luke tells us Jesus reiterates the same teaching in the Sermon on the Plain. So let's just look very briefly at uh, Luke's Gospel, chapter 21. And he goes on, nation will rise against nation in verse 10. Kingdom against kingdom, there will be great earthquakes, famines in diverse places. Now again, most of you know this, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom, what does that mean? The word for nation there is ethnon, ethnon, ethnic, okay? ethnic groupings, racial groupings, ethnic groupings, tribal groupings. Kingdom against kingdom, Basilea, the political conflicts will be the result of ethnic and racial conflicts. Now, again, we've stated this a number of times. It does not mean yellow against white or Caucasian, Caucasian against black. It goes way beyond that. It's what you see in Southeast Asia, after the Americans and Australians left, the killing fields of Cambodia, the, the yellow Vietnamese communists and the Cambodian yellow Cambodian communists massacred each other and then massacred their own kind. And then communist China had a war with communist Vietnam. Their politics don't matter. It was based on racial conflict. You look at post-colonial Africa, the genocide of Rwanda and Burundi and the, in South Africa, the hatred between the Zulus and the causes, it, it's unbelievable. It's not about color. It goes beyond that. In Northern Ireland, you saw it was Celt against Celt <laughs> based on religious tribalism. Um, the political conflicts will always have some kind of a racial or ethnic origin, but it goes beyond things like skin color. It goes beyond the national identity. Yugoslavia was another example. The Serbs and the Croats and the Bosnians, that stuff goes back to the Middle Ages, that hatred. Then it explodes. No matter what people tell you about political and economic systems and global peace and world governments, Nation will turn against nation. Ethnon will turn against ethnon. Tribe will turn against tribe. The Hutus and the Tutsis are going to hate each other. The Chinese and the Vietnamese are going to hate each other. Okay. It doesn't matter. It'd be white against white in Yugoslavia, black against black in Africa, yellow against yellow in Asia. It goes beyond that. The only real unity is the unity of Christ, because to us, it's not based on birth. It's based on second birth. Our identity is not based on our birth. Our identity is based on our second birth. Their identity is always going to be based on birth, and they're going to bring that baggage with them. You see that now with the woke movement in America. They're bringing the racial baggage with them, trying to drag it into the church. It's, <laughs> We're supposed to be beyond that. That's the world. That is the world. This is going to happen. But now we go on and we see things further. In Luke 17, we read the following. Just like the lightning, when it flashes from the dark of the sky to the light, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Verse 23 of Luke 17. It's not just Luke 21. It's Luke 17. 
you must read Luke 21 in light of Luke 17. The things Jesus said in Luke 21 have to be understood as Luke 21 gives a certain aspect, while Luke 17 gives another aspect. Okay. Well, Luke chapter 12. I'll just arbitrarily read verse 35. Be dressed in readiness and keep your lamp lit. That's from the Song of Solomon. The bridegroom is coming. Don't just read Luke 21, the Olivet Discourse. Read what Jesus said in Luke 12 and in Luke 17 in light of Luke's version of the Olivet Discourse. And then when you do that, look at Luke's version in light of Matthew's. But with Matthew, it's the same. It's not just Matthew 24. It's Matthew 24 and 25. But it's not just Matthew 24 and 25 on the Mount of Olives. Let's look at Matthew 10, when Jesus sent the apostles out in pairs. Verse 5. These 12 Jesus sent out after instructing them, do not go to the way of the Gentiles, nor enter the city of the Samaritans, but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. Freely you receive, freely give. Do not acquire gold or silver or copper for your money belts or a bag for your journey or even two coats or sandals or a staff for the worker is worthy of his support. And whatever city or village you will enter, who is worthy in it? and stay at his house until you leave that city. As you enter the home, give it your greeting. And he goes on like this, okay? But then he says, I'm sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be shrewd as serpents and innocent as doves. Beware of men, for they will hand you over to courts, scourge you in their synagogues, and you'll even be brought before governors and kings for my name's sake. Notice persecution of the faithful believers begins within the so-called church, not outside of it. Persecution will begin within the church, not outside of it. The harlot church will persecute the faithful believers. Then it will become political and legal. He goes on, verse 21, brother will betray brother to death, and father his child, and children will rise against parents. Make a note of that. It has to do with Elijah. Okay. Well, when Jesus sent the 10, the 12 out in Matthew 10, that stuff didn't happen. That stuff didn't happen. They weren't betrayed then or brought before governors and kings then. It happened later to a degree in the book of Acts, but it's what Jesus said is going to happen to the faithful church at the end of the age. You understand? It's only partially fulfilled in Matthew 10. The rest of it has to take place in the future. Matthew 24 is the same. It's only partially fulfilled in 70 AD. The rest has to happen in the future. You can't just look at Matthew 24. It must be 24 and 25. But realize that Matthew 10 tells us things about the same situation that's going to happen prophetically, that you have to read that in light of Matthew 24 and 25. You have to read the co-text, not just the context. Then, when you've read 24 and 25 in light of 10, or Luke 21 in light of chapters 12 and 17, then you compare Luke and Matthew. But the simplest place to begin is the shortest, Mark 13. 
Mark has one primary discourse on the return of Christ. There are other things that touch on it, but the primary is in one place. It's not spread out as it is in the other synoptics. Then there's the issue of John. John, the apostle, does not have an Olivet Discourse. He does not have a major discourse on the last days. There is a short discourse on the last days in chapter 16. Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will grieve. And then he goes on, whenever a woman is in labor, she has pain because her hour has come. But when she gives birth to the child, she no longer remembers the anguish because of the joy of the child. Therefore, you too have grief now, but I will see you again, and your heart will rejoice, and no one will take your joy away. Again, maternal labor is always an illustration of the birth pangs of the church. This relates to Revelation 12, but don't worry about that. You may already be familiar with it. You've only got that one bit in John. Rather, John is punctuated. It's punctuated by single verses almost that make you question, how does this fit the context? But it's talking about the end. One of the most important in John is in chapter 5. In John chapter 5, Jesus says the following. He makes it clear that something is going to happen. He says in verse 41, I do not receive glory of men, but I know that you do not have the love of God in yourselves. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, you will receive him. Now, that is a major prophecy about the Antichrist. A major prophecy about the Antichrist. But it occurs in one verse. There are other things like that in John. John is punctuated with references to the second coming. There is no concise body of teaching on it, with a very partial exception of in John 16. Now, there are things in the high priestly prayer and things like that in John 17 that allude to it. But basically, John does not have what the synoptics have. Why? John's eschatology, if you want to use the term, John's teaching on the last days would come later. He would author the book of Revelation. And John's epistles, thematically, especially 1 John, are the apostolic commentary on what Jesus was talking about concerning the last days. John's epistles deal more with the last days than Paul's or Peter's. Now, you've got it in Peter, and you've got it in Paul and 2 Thessalonians and things like that and 1 Timothy 4. But John really goes into the thing about the Antichrist. And then it's John who writes Revelation. John's eschatology comes later. Okay, Peter, Paul, Matthew, Mark, James, they come first. John is the last apostle alive. The church is very discouraged during the persecution of uh, Domitian. John is exiled on Patmos from Ephesus when he gets the revelation to encourage the church because people were despondent. Where's Jesus? The apostles are all dead except for John. What's happening here? Separate subject. So we must understand the structure of Jesus' teaching on the last days. He recycles themes from the Old Testament, from many prophets, 
but especially Daniel and Jeremiah. Jesus recycles the end time teaching prophecies of Daniel and Jeremiah, but many other references to other prophets as well. But Daniel and Jeremiah are the most. Okay. That tells us the times of Daniel and the times of Jeremiah are really important in getting the frame because what happened in their days is going to happen at the end of the age. Why is Jesus quoting these guys? Because the situation they were dealing with historically in their, what a theologian calls Sitzemleben, what they were dealing with at their time foreshadows what's going to happen at the last time. Okay. Again, Jeremiah was before the Babylonian captivity. In the book of Revelation is Babylon the Great. And Daniel is obvious. Okay. So, we look at the Olivet Discourse in light of each other. But then we have to go look at it in light of the Old Testament. Now, there is, in addition to Jeremiah, Yermiyahu Hanavi, and also Daniel, a third period of Israel's history that teaches something tremendous about the end. This comes primarily from 1 Kings, chapters 17, 18, 19, the time of Elijah. Look with me, please to the end of the Old Testament, the book of Malachi, chapter 4. Verse 4, remember the Torah of Moses, my servant, even the statutes and ordinances, which I commanded him in Horeb for all Israel. Behold, I'm going to send you Elijah the prophet, before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. He will restore the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, so that I will not come and smite the land with a curse. Things are going to be bad enough. We have the third situation with Elijah, in addition to Jeremiah, and in addition to the book of Daniel. The last thing it says in the Old Testament. Once more, I'll read Malachi chapter 4, verse 5 and 6. Behold, I'm going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. He'll restore the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers so that I will not come and smite the land with a curse. Now, let's go to Matthew chapter 17 in light of that. Verse 11. And he answered, this is Jesus, Elijah is coming. And will yes. we, he's coming and he will restore all things. Elijah came. Well, I say to you that Elijah already came, and they did not recognize him, but did to him whatever they wanted. So also the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. Notice that Jesus said, Elijah came, and Elijah is coming again. John the Baptist, therefore, <coughs> teaches us something about the nature and character of Elijah to come. Okay? Eliyahu Hanavi, in Hebrew we also say, Eliyahu HaTishbi, Elijah the Tishbite. Okay, where he was from. Mainly associated with the Northern Kingdom, but not exclusively. Now, Elijah, Elisha, and John the Baptist all had the same spirit. 
there is a continuity. By the Spirit, I don't mean a an anointing of the Holy Spirit that was put on Elijah is the same one that was put on Elisha in double portion and then put on Yochanan Hamatbil, John the Baptist. With this in view, look with me, please, once more to the Gospel of St. Matthew. Chapter 14. At that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard the news about Jesus and said to his servants, This is John the Baptist. He has risen from the dead. And that is why miraculous powers have come to work. For when Herod had, had John arrested, he bound him and put him in prison because of Herodias, the wife of his brother Philip, who was Herod Philip I. For John had been saying to him, it is not lawful for you to have her, that is your brother's wife. Although Herod wanted to put him to death, he feared the crowd because they regarded John as a prophet. But when Herod's birthday came, the daughter of Herodias danced before them and pleased Herod so much that he promised with an oath to give her whatever she asked. Having been prompted by her mother, she said, give me here on a platter the head of John the Baptist. And although he was grieved, the king commanded it to be given to her because of his oaths and because of his dinner guests. He sent and had John beheaded in the prison and his head was bought on a platter and given to the girl who Josephus identifies as Salome, Salome, and brought it to her mother. His disciples came and took away the corpse and buried it, and they went and reported to Jesus. Now, notice the pattern if you're not familiar with this. With Elijah and Jezebel, Jezebel goes to Ahab, tries to get the king to kill Elijah over Naboth's vineyard. Same thing happens. Herodias, the wicked woman, goes to the king, the son of Herod the Great, and tries to get the person with the spirit of Elijah that's John killed. You understand the same thing happens? The wicked woman turns the king against Elijah. This prefigures what will happen in the book of Revelation. Some people think Elijah is one of the two witnesses. That is another story. But we know this. The ministry of Elijah comes back. And for sure, he will confront false religion who will attempt to turn the political authorities against him and silence him there's a good case to be made for him being in Revelation 11, a good case. But I leave that there for the moment. Let's continue. There is a pattern. What is going to happen when Elijah comes back is what happened to John and what happened to Elijah. So, we see the puzzle. It's always going to be within the framework of what happened. There's nothing going to happen that hasn't, in microcosm, happened before. There's nothing that's going to happen that has not, in shadow, happened before. There's nothing going to happen outside of the framework that we already have if we approach the scriptures correctly. So, let's move forward on this basis. Let's look at this. He's coming again. He already came. He was John in the character of Elijah. Now this, of course, presents the issue. Does this mean Elijah is going to come literally? He was taken in a chariot and he's coming back? 
Or is it going to be like John? Somebody's going to come with the same spirit. <laughs> Remember when Caleb told Moses, God's going to take the spirit off you and put it on the elders? The same anointing that Moses had was put on the leaders of Israel. So too, the Holy Spirit was put on the apostles and then on believers with the spirit of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. That's how it works. Is it going to be like that? Or is it going to be literally the person? This is a question. But we always begin with his own time and what it meant in order to understand what it means for our time and what it's going to mean. We always do that. If you're not familiar with the terms, you need to look at some of our teaching on the Peshet and the Pesha. The Peshet is the simple, straightforward meaning. The Pesha is when it's recapitulated, it happens again, okay? Um, classically out of Egypt, I called my son from Hosea 11, it's talking of the Exodus. That's the Pesha, the simple meaning, is the Exodus of Israel. The Pesha, Matthew quotes it in the Nativity narrative. When Herod the Great dies and Jesus comes out of Egypt, out of Egypt I called my son. You've got the Peshet, the simple, straightforward, literal meaning of the time, but then you have the future prophetic meaning prefigured by it. Separate subject, I only mentioned it in passing. Nothing is going to happen that hasn't happened before. If we don't understand history, we are never going to understand prophecy. If we don't know what did happen, we're not going to understand what is going to happen. In fact, we're not only not going to understand what is going to happen, we're not even going to be able to understand what currently is happening. So let's begin with his name, Elijah, Eliahu, Hatishbi. The name. The names of the Hebrew prophets and other characters in Scripture are generally indicative of their character and or their mission they're calling if they're a good figure. The name is indicative of the character and of the calling. Okay. Well, why is Elijah called my God is Yahweh? Or in Hebrew, Eliyah, my God is who? Is he? In Hebrew, he is who? <laughs> okay. The word for he in Hebrew is who. My God is he. We've explained this before. I'll go through it quickly. It's the problem then. It's the problem now. What's in a name? Baal worship was the problem in the time of Elijah, the priest of Baal. Backslidden priests of the Israelites worshiping the Canaanite god Baal whose origins were in Babylon. Now, it's a big deal here. Hosea says that Yahweh is Israel's Baal. Baal being the Hebrew word for husband, master, and owner. We are all Baal worshipers. The question is, which Baal are you worshiping? Who is our master? Who is the bridegroom of the church? To whom is, is, is Israel betrothed? Okay. Well, Yahweh is the Baal. The Canaanites had a different Baal, who also in their mythology rose from the dead every spring. <laughs> and they worshipped him in sacrificial rituals on the same days as the Hebrew holy days. So you have the same holy days, the same festivals, and the same name. But what Baal did is what happens today. You make the title into a personal name. In Arabic, there is a word for God that's generic, El. But Allah is essentially the Arab, Arabic word for God, which they convolute Allah Elohim, El El. They turn the title of the Nabataean moon god 
into a personal name. You understand? This idea of title is always a big deal. The Jehovah's Witnesses, one of their attempted counter arguments against the deity of Jesus is, well, it calls him, you know, mighty Kansas, uh, mighty God. That's a title. It's not his name. That they say things like that. That's their argument. Any properties of deity that the scripture ascribes to Jesus, they say, well, that's a title. That's not his name. Only Yahweh is, is his name. And they're too ignorant to know that Jehovah is not even, they don't even know where Jehovah comes from. Jehovah is it comes from Yiddish. It combines the accents and syllables of Yahweh, Yehovah, with the Hebrew word Adonai, meaning Lord. Adonai, Yehovah, and they put them together and they get Jehovah. <laughs> it comes from Yiddish. They don't even, not even, Yiddish is like Hebrewized German. They don't even know it. But such it is with them. Now, what is Yehovah? Asher Haya Hovevi Yavo, who was, who is, who is to come. Who are you? I am the I am. I am what? I am he who was, who is, and who is to come. Okay. You'll find in cults and in false religions, trying to use the name of Jesus, they will give him a title that is not scriptural. There are many titles of Jesus in scripture. Many. The Lion of Judah the Holy One of Israel, the Seed of Abraham, the Rose of Sharon, the Bright and Morning Star. There are many titles of Jesus. The Jesus of Latter-day Saints is not one of them. <laughs> it is not a scriptural title of Jesus in either Testament. So they had to get another book, the Book of Mormon. You always see there's something in the title that will have the same name but mean something different than Scripture does. You got a Baal, we got a Baal. Again, you know, you got two names in the telephone directory of Robert Jones. Does that mean they're the same person? <laughs> One's a dentist, you know, <laughs> and one's a lawyer. They're not the same. So it goes. Let's continue. This was the issue Elijah was up against. It's not that the people said, we're going to go worship the God of the Phoenicians that they got from the Canaanites. It was rather, we believe that their God and our God is the same God. The differences are only cultural, not substantive. <laughs> if you look at Hinduism, they have a trinity, don't they? Sitra, Rama, and Vishnu, right? They have a trinity. Brahmanism. Um, there are people who say Krishna is like Jesus, and or they'll say that you know, the Trinity, which is the death, you know, the Sitra, uh, I'm sorry, Shiva, Shiva, the death person of the Trinity, that, that well, that's the same as Trinity as, as Christians have. It's just culturally different, linguistically. It, false religion always counterfeits. But the ultimate counterfeit is to counterfeit Jesus. This is what the Antichrist will in some way do. They have a different Jesus. When you say the scripture, the scriptural Jesus is one who warns, I'm coming back like I went. If anyone says he's here physically in the inner rooms and in the wilderness, don't believe it. I'm coming back to where I left. But the Roman church says, no, he returns physically in the Eucharist as bread and wine. That's a different Jesus. 
the Jesus of Latter-day Saints is a different Jesus. The Michael the Archangel Jesus of Jehovah's Witnesses, that's ancient Arianism. It's a different Jesus. So, Elijah was up against a different Baal, but he had the same name. You understand? This problem with the same name and the confusion about titles is the key to spiritual deception. New Ages have Matria, the Cosmic Christ. The Roman Catholic Church has the Eucharistic Christ. Islam has Isa, a prophet inferior to Mohammed. They all have a Jesus, and they try to tell you it's the same Jesus, but it's not the same Jesus. Sometimes it's a demon idol. Like Baal was. Well, his name comes first. The ministry of Elijah in the last days will do the same. He will affirm the monotheistic truth of the God of Israel against interfaith and ecumenism. Those who want to get in bed with the Mormons and with the Pope, and we can all be one. The ministry of Elijah will come against that, this eclecticism, this syncretism, this spiritual seduction. The ministry of Elijah in the last days is going to be in the character of Elijah and do what Elijah did. He's going to draw a distinction between your Jesus and the scriptural one. That has to be understood. What's in the name? Second thing we see about Elijah. He was in a political situation where Phoenicia was having its golden age. Whoever controlled the seaways would control the world. The Soviet Union knew this and tried to build a bigger and better navy than the West. They failed, but they tried to do it during the Cold War. They knew the history. Britannia ruled the waves after Francis Drake sank the Armada. It's, that was it. Before that, it was the Spanish main. Spain was the number one world power. The Vikings ruled everything from the Urals to Greenland. Some say they reached Canada. And everything from North Africa to Lapland, the north of Norway and Scandinavia and Sweden. That's a big chunk of real estate. How did they do it? They were sailors. <laughs> no superpower can be a superpower without having a large navy and a large merchant navy. It has never happened historically and never will. Britain being a classical example, United States, you always need that naval power and merchant fleets and things of this nature. In the time of Elijah, it was the Phoenicians. It was the Phoenicians. There have been incredible sailors in history. How they did it, I can't imagine. But the Polynesians went from New Zealand and places like that to Hawaii, not knowing where they were going on these ships with an outrigger and paddled their way through thousands of miles in the Pacific, and they would have to fish and stuff it. How they did it, this is absolutely remarkable. Thor Heyerdahl wrote Kantiki is another this literary reference to this concept. But the Vikings were incredible. Imagine sailing from Europe across the North Atlantic with that cold and tumultuous waves, not knowing where you were going. But they did it. Well, the Phoenicians were probably the first world empire to do that. They were coastal sailors, but the Romans adopted the Phoenician trade routes. And in the book of Acts, where you see Paul, Paul's journeys, he's following those same routes that were established by the Phoenicians. They were the maritime power, and they used it to build a political empire. 
on the basis of their political, military, and economic power, they impose their religion. Mount Carmel, in the modern city of Haifa, Israel, looks like the Rock of Gibraltar. It protrudes straight out of the Mediterranean almost. It's not hugely high, but from sea level, it's pretty high. And it looks high. It was the ideal high place to compete with Mount Zion in Jerusalem to put another temple. It has always been a center of false religion to this day. The Roman Catholic apparitions of Mary, Our Lady of Mount Carmel, similar to what happens that they claim in Fatima and Lourdes and Knock and places like this, it's in Guadalupe, it's the same thing, Mount Carmel. In the days of Justin Martyr, it was a Babylonian priest cult. Um, the Baha'i cult, the tomb of the Bab, the Baha'is, that's their holy city, that's their Mecca. It's where the Bab is, Baula is, is buried, okay? Uh, it's always been this false religious place. And it was there Elijah battled the priests of Baal. Okay, it was there Elijah battled the priests of Baal. Somehow that will happen again. Remember, persecution begins within the church. The priests of Baal were not Phoenicians, they were Jews. It was Jezebel, the seductress. Now, Jesus takes her as a figure and applies her in the book of Revelation, you tolerate the woman Jezebel who beguiles my servants to eat food sacrificed to idols. Remember Elijah lamented those who ate at Jezebel's table? In Proverbs, the sexual seductress is an illustration of spiritual seduction. We have teachings explaining this. But Jesus personified it all in Jezebel and in the great harlot in Revelation. Seduction. There will be a great spiritual seduction. In this seduction, the powers of government and religion will be seduced and controlled by some kind of a demonically influenced female spirit in the character of Jezebel who seduces the servants of the Lord. Now, let's look at the present world. I'm not a misogynist. My wife is smarter than I am. <laughs> my wife is, 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 yeah, she's, my wife is a mathematician and she's, I, I think she's smarter than me, at least in certain, res, certain respects. Um, she, would, she would say I'm smarter in other respects, but that doesn't mean. Uh, I have no problem with smart women and capable women. I wouldn't mind if someday, when she's not old enough yet, but when she's legally old enough, I would not mind if the Lord does not come back, if the Afro-American woman, Candace Owen, became the first female president of the United States, I would vote for her. If Nikki Haley, who's an Asian-American, half Asian American, if she became the first president of the United States who was a woman, I'd probably vote for her. I've got no problem with women. I have a problem with wicked women. Stupid women. As Proverbs des describes them. Now you look at what's happening in the world today and it's a direct correlation to what's happening in the church. A direct correlation. We are called to be salt and light. Why do you have out of control women having so much power 
and political influence, more than you've ever seen in modern history. Why do you have people like Elizabeth Warren, pro-death, pro-abortion, something fundamentally against the nature of women to kill their own baby? When a normal woman, certainly when a Christian woman becomes pregnant, she begins to even think differently. <laughs> Everything's focused on the baby, not on killing it. So to my wife, so to my daughter, so to my sisters. Elizabeth Warren. Maxine Waters. This Governor Whitmer of Minnesota. This mayor of Baltimore. Barbara Feinstein. Kamala Harris. Kamala Harris slept with another woman's husband, Willie Brown, who was speaker of the legislature in California to get his, got his political backing to become a district attorney and then state attorney general. She literally was an adulteress who committed serial adultery with another woman's husband for years and got his political backing. That's how she got on the political ladder. And now she's one step away from the White House. When she was state attorney general in California, she sent hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of black men to jail for marijuana. And then admitted she smoked it herself. <laughs> but just put all these guys, most of them were black, in jail for marijuana under the Clinton three strikes and you're out thing. Now, don't get me wrong, I don't agree with smoking marijuana. I quit when I became a Christian, but I don't agree with putting people in jail for smoking it either, unless they drive a vehicle or something like that, or give it to a kid or something. But she did. Well, if she thought it was so bad, why did she smoke it herself? But then trafficking in body parts is a felony. To take aborted fetuses dismember their corpses after you abort them, even with partial birth abortion, and sell the body parts commercially in a market is against the law, but it was done in California, and it was filmed by a videographer. The Planned Parenthood-related people who did it were not prosecuted by Camilla Harris. Instead, the videographer was prosecuted by Camilla Harris. How dare you expose this dismemberment of aborted fetuses for commercial purposes? She prosecuted him. This is a Jezebel spirit. You see it in the political realm. Hillary Clinton, another one. Susan Rice, another one. You've got these women running wild. Not good women, not Candace Owen, and not the... Nikki Haley. You got these crazy, and they're all over the place. The squad. You have Omar from Somalia, a radical Muslim. You have Tliab, dances with a Palestinian flag from Gaza. In the US Congress, they call them the squad. Alexandra Ortega Cortez, the woman is absurd. She says she, she's like she wants to turn the United States into Venezuela. A just crazy woman. In New York, they were, were going to build the East Coast headquarters of Amazon in New York in Queens in her district. And to recover development costs, they said, give us a tax incentive on future earnings and we'll do it. It's going to create 25,000 high paid jobs and another 25,000 spinoff jobs. 50,000 jobs, most of them well paid. And she says, no, these tax, this tax money, it should be going to schools and it should be going to social programs. <laughs> the money didn't even exist yet. <laughs> it wasn't a subsidy. It was a tax credit. And she was too stupid to know it. And people voted for it. Why, why do you have this? Why do you have this? These renegade pro-abortion women running around killing babies. And, why do you have this? We have the right to kill our baby. 
Look at the church. When the body of Christ allows a Joyce Meyer to run wild, who teaches false doctrine, when the body of Christ allows a Paula White under third marriage to run wild, when the body of Christ allows Lectio Divina New Age Beth Moore to run wild, when the body of Christ allows a false prophetess like Cindy Jacobs to run wild, if that's in the church, what do you expect in the corridors of power? What do you expect in Parliament or Congress? If this is what you got in the church, this Jezebel spirit, and the men are Ahabs, they're being afraid of being called <laughs> alpha males or <laughs> misogenic or war on women. The men are wearing the skirts, the women are wearing the trousers, but it's happening in the church. I've seen it in Britain with Stuart and Deborah Menlos, the same exact thing. Women running wild saying crazy things. Somebody says, God the Father is not the creator. She defends and promotes him. She talks about the Antichrist and all this stuff, but she's partnered with Chris Rosebro, who says there is no Antichrist and there is no 666. This woman's running wild, crazy, out of control. Husband, what's going happen? What is this? This is the Jezebel spirit. This is Beth Moore. This is Joyce Meyer. This is Paula White. This is Deborah Menlos. This is Cindy Jacobs. It's all of it. It is in the church. And it is in governments, in nations that profess to be Judeo-Christian. This is what Elijah was up against. The influence of Jezebel was both religious, spiritually corrupting, and politically corrupting. You will see the same thing in the last days. This unleashed Jezebel spirit will be both spiritually corrupting and politically corrupting. What Elijah was up against is what the last days are going to be like. Everybody understand? That's what he was at. Well, let's go further. Look with me, please, to Matthew. I'm sorry, to Mark. Let's look at Mark 13, please. Mark's version of the Alabama Discourse. We've read it in Luke already. Let's look at it in Mark chapter 13, verse 12. Brother will betray brother to death, and a father his child, and children rise up against parents and have them put to death. Now, this immediately follows Jesus' warnings about wars and rumors of wars. Okay. The generation gap follows the wars. Obviously, in the last hundred years, we've seen an increase in wars and in the magnitude of their destruction. World War I was called the Great War. It was only the blitz and the civilian casualties that made the Second World War worse than the first. In terms of military casualties, World War I was worse than World War II. Almost every village and town in England will have a cenotaph or a memorial. And you'll see there's more soldiers and almost all of them killed in the First World War than the Second. All over England, all over Britain. New Zealand, Australia, the same. More killed in the First than the Second. It was the civilian casualties from the Blitz that made the made Second World War worse. The Great War, the war to end all wars, they called it, but it didn't. Anyway, after that war, there was a generation 
that came along who didn't remember the war. So the people who were in the war, their worldview was forged by the war. But these kids came up in the Roaring Twenties. <laughs> and then they went into the Great Depression, so-called. They had a different worldview than their parents. They were into the Charleston dancers and all that, you know, you know with that, you know, down, 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 all this stuff. Down, 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 down. And all this stuff. And then it was alcohol because of prohibition, the way it would later become pot and acid and things. So there was a credibility gap. After the Second World War, there was a credibility gap. The generation that went through the war, their whole worldview was forged by the war. By the late 50s, when rock and roll came along, <laughs> And you had the first the Teddy Boys in England and the Greasers in America, and then you had the hippies. And they had a completely different worldview than the older generation. The wars sociologically engineered generation gaps, credibility gaps between generations. Those who remember the war, those who didn't. So the hippies protested the Vietnam War. They said, look, this is a corrupt war. It's not constitutional. There's no declaration of war. You're saying go fight the communists, but there's detente with the communists. You're trading with the Russians and now the Chinese who are supplying the North Vietnamese, and you're telling us to go fight the North Vietnamese when you're trading with the people who are giving them the guns to kill us. This is all corrupt. But the previous generation said, I had a fight after Pearl Harbor. I had a fight after the Blitz. I had, they, they were locked in a mentality because of the war. They couldn't see the other side of the coin. Wars have a way of determining the outlook of an entire generation. It's not a coincidence that Jesus said wars are going to increase before he said there's going to be a generational conflict. This generational conflict will get into the church, and it already has. You look at Mike Bickle or Bill Johnson, the New Apostolic Reformation, Hillsong, that is not any form of biblical Christianity that Christians of generations past would recognize. They wouldn't recognize Hillsong, which is built on sex scandal anyway, it looks like it, and, and financial corruption, so it looks like. That's what the evidence points to. Or, you know, the, the Bill Johnson and all this mysticism, and, the, and, and what Mike Bickle does with the kids, and it's terrible. And Stephen Furtick and these things, this is not traditional Christianity, and it's not biblical Christianity. But there's a generation gap. This is generation split. Like Andy Stanley and, and Steve Chalk bring, bringing the new generation away from Christ. It's happening. Elijah will come against this. You understand? It's going to damage not just society, but it's going to damage the church significantly. Parents against children, children against parents. The church is going to be torn apart because these things of the world will get into it. The ethnone, the, the ethnic thing will get in. The Jezebel thing will get in. The generation thing will get in. When I see people singing, it's unbelievable, the ignorance. These are the days of Elijah. <laughs> they think it's something positive. They sing about it in a celebratory manner. <laughs> These are the days of Elijah. Bah, 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 whatever they're talking about. The days of Elijah were terrible. 
finally became very lonely. They were isolated. So terrible that Elijah didn't know there was 7,000 who didn't follow the program. What's happening now all over the world? All over the world. Can you help me find the church? We're meeting in a home with friends. We can't find the church. It's still scriptural. You know, what are we going to do? Now the churches are closed with COVID. You know, we're meeting online. And then Satan sends a hacker to try to disrupt it. You know, somebody who's just controlled by the devil, obviously. That was the days of Elijah. A remnant. The mainstream follows Jezebel. The mainstream is seduced. The mainstream goes along with Ahab's agenda, which is really Jezebel's insidious seeding of his mind. Watch those things. Eclecticism and syncretism, confusing the one true God with other gods coming in his name. Allah, Jesus Christ, the Latter-day Saints, the Eucharistic Jesus of Rome. Watch that. Two, watch the feminism getting into the church. The ecumenism and interfaith, syncretism, eclecticism, then watch the feminism. Third, watch the generational splits. Fourth, watch for the faithful people who love the Lord and remain loyal to his word. Feeling alone, feeling disconnected, feeling isolated, feeling at times they're the only one. They're not, but you can understand why they feel that way. In those days, they didn't have Zoom. And we may not have it much longer either. It's only a matter of time before they begin coming against Christians. These social media platforms are run by godless people, obviously. They're into a cancel culture and censorship. You speak and say you don't agree with same-sex marriage, they'll call it a hate crime, we're closing you down. It's coming to that. That is one of the reasons we've begun RTN. I would urge anybody who watches Moriel to begin watching the Moriel teaching on RTN because it's only a matter of time before Google and YouTube and these companies and certainly Facebook and, and Twitter begin coming after believers. In fact, they're probably already doing it to a degree, but the worst is yet to come. That's one of the reasons we began. That is the reason we began RTN. If you watch Moriel TV, do me a favor, switch to RTN because we they, they can't shut that down so easily. It's our own. The Lord gave it to us. Uh, this is what it's coming. People are going to think they're alone. They're isolated. I'm the only one. I can't find the church where I live. My husband and myself don't have any fellowship. Those are the days of Elijah. And those are what the last days are going to be like. Does everybody get it? Let's stop. I can take questions only about tonight's subject, something we covered tonight. Thank you, Jacob. There's a lot of questions I would like to ask as well, but I'm going to hand it over to um, the, the online studio audience. But before we do so, I just want to reassure people, individually tonight, no one here has been hacked. These are people who we know have probably come from the YouTube live stream. Um, and I, I appreciate many of you have put through comments tonight suggesting where it was coming from and people who have actually been uh, infiltrating the system. So thank you all for your, your help tonight. The problem we do have is when these things happen, the time that I hear it isn't necessarily the time that you hear it. So it's, it's always a reactionary type thing. So as I was cancelling out one, then somebody else came on board. So it was concerted effort by the devil there. There's actually three people. It wasn't just one person. Um, what I would suggest uh, we may have to come back to in the future. We used to have to send out the weekly um, coded link to everybody via the email. 
but we just became so overwhelmed with it, it just became difficult to manage that and to do it accurately and in time. I think that may be something we may have to go back to, but I'll certainly I'll discuss that with Jacob and the rest of the guys over the next couple of days. But I just want to thank you tonight. For those of you who have joined the Facebook group, it really is doing really well. For those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, this is your opportunity to get together after the program during the week to develop your fellowship, to explore some of the things Jacob has talked about, to actually look at it in detail and to help others who maybe haven't got the concept or just need a little bit of help along. But certainly a lot of you have joined that and we really do appreciate that you have actually taken the time to do so. If you haven't subscribed to RTN TV, then if we have to go and send out the email on a weekly basis, that's where you will get the email from. So please go along to RTN TV. The, the, uh, email, the email address, the, the website is rtntv.org. rtntv.org. You will see the details are simply put on your details. We'll collect all that. And if we have to then go back to sending a, a, a weekly mail drop, we'll do that. But we do suspect it's come from the YouTube stream tonight because the actual code was published there. And obviously people are just trolling through it and they picked it up. But we thank the Lord that it wasn't too disruptive. Anything you've missed tonight, you'll get it again on the live stream, on the recording. So we thank you for that. First question tonight, I want to hand over to Deborah Garner. Deborah uh, is on the panel tonight and she asked a question. In Where are you located, Deborah? Deborah, are you still there? Yes. Hi, Jacob. Hi. Where are you located, please? I'm in Connecticut. Connecticut. Stamford, Norwalk, New Southern Haven. Southington. Dead center of everything. Oh, by Hartford. Yeah, not too far. Yeah. And I've seen you at the Open Door in New York more than once, me and my okay. daughter. But I've got some pictures. I'll send you one. Okay. <laughs> You got a picture of me? Where did you get it? On the wall in the post office? Where... <laughs> Want to dead or alive. Yeah. <laughs> What's your question, so, Deborah? Oh, let me go back up. Well, basically, good. yeah, I put it in the comments section, but the question is really, in terms of the spirit of Elijah, do you believe that this could be an anointing that really falls on the remnant or the body, a prophetic anointing, because you 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 sort of feel this rising up, you know, this anointing on us to to respond to this culture. Uh, yeah, remember this the sons of the prophets in the story of Elijah. The story, the sons of the prophets. It was fifty of them, right? And then there was Elisha. So yes, it does spread to others, but not to the church at large. Only right. to certain ones. So the answer right. is yes. It'll, it'll be like with Elijah and the sons of the prophets. <laughs> one's a picture of the other. But that's a good question. Another question, please, if we have one. Amos, can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. Go ahead, buddy. Where are you located, please? Uh, Jacob, <clears throat> excuse me. I'm located in Staffordshire, UK. Okay. And your name, please? It's Dave. Okay, Dave. Dave, Dave what Okay. So my question is, um, I do a lot of listening to Chuck Misler, some, um, a friend of yours. Well, and he's with the Lord now, but yes, we were friends. Indeed. Um, <clears throat> so he, he talks about the difference between um, Luke 21 and Matthew 24. Are you, are you familiar with his teaching? Broadly speaking, I did a number of conferences with him. He, he mentioned the fact that Luke 21, even though it contains a very similar narrative to Matthew 24, concentrated on a different timeline. Whereas Matthew was very Jewish, talking about the end times, Luke was talking about the immediacy of, of Jerusalem and was very church orientated rather than the end time Jewish perspective. Okay. I was trying to see whether you understood, okay. whether you agreed with yeah. that on the uh, Okay. Luke was a Syrophoenician convert to Judaism. He was from the Greek world, okay? Luke and Paul had an advantage. They understood <clears throat> both the Greek world and the Gentile world. Luke and Paul both understood both, okay? Luke, right from the beginning, his genealogy goes back to Adam. It's universal. It's written for people generally. There is Judea content in Luke, but the Judea content in Luke, not found in Matthew, for instance, is only there because Gentiles needed to know it 
Jews already knew it, so Matthew didn't have to tell them, if that makes any sense. Sure. Um, so when you see Judaic specifically about the Jews in Luke, he's telling Gentiles things that Gentiles probably wouldn't have known that Matthew didn't tell them because he knew they knew it, and John similarly. So it's fair to say that Luke was speaking to a Gentile readership as well as a Jewish readership, but it was a general readership. As opposed to Matthew, that was, first of all, written to a Jewish readership. That is true. Both Matthew and Luke, however, deal with the events of 70 AD and the close of the age. It would be wrong to say that Luke does not address the close of the age because you can't just look at Luke 21. You mm -hmm. have to, as we said, look at Luke 12 and you have to look at Luke 17. That's what I was saying. I mean, Misler was, Misler was talking about uh, using the words in Luke before these things. Yeah. And Matthew says after these things. So yeah. he's, he's, I think Misler was trying to draw a distinction in the use of the language. So the yeah. signs of the times were before these things in Luke, yet in Matthew it was after these things. Yeah, you can say that, but you can't say that when you look at the compendium of Luke's teaching on the last days. Right. For instance, let's look again at Luke 17. Verse 22, the days will come when you will long to see one of the days of the Son of Man, but you will not see it. They will say to you, look there, look here. Do not go away and do not run after them. For just as the lightning, when it flashes out of one part of the sky and shines to the other part of the sky, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. Now that can only be talking about something to come. Right, sure. You understand, chapter 12 is the same. I don't know if you were with us, Dave, but in the beginning I said, don't just look at Luke 21. Yeah. Look at Luke 21 in light of Luke 12 and Luke 17. You've got to get the whole picture of Luke. That will okay. give you a different perspective of chapter 21, and then you compare that to Matthew. Mm -hmm. you understand what I'm saying? Indeed, Chuck, yeah. Look, Chuck Missler and myself, we were friends. We agreed on a lot of things. Uh, he liked my teaching. He publicly would plug it on the radio in America and things like this. And, and you know, I, I liked Chuck. Um, we did conferences together in the States, a few in England, uh, things like that. But Chuck was very strongly in the pre-tribulational camp. Mm. I am very strongly not in the pre-tribulational camp. And a lot of his eschatology or his teaching of the end was definitely, definitely characterized and defined by a pre-tribulational presupposition. Mm. Well, mine was not. You understand? Mm. Sure. That's, that's the answer. Thank Thanks, you. David. Thank okay. you. Maybe that's a good question. Thank you for that. Um, Enelson, <laughs> You and Nelson will go to the weekend. Well, I'm getting it. Shelby. Shelby. Yes. Uh, Nelson, you guys hear me? And then make it after Nelson, please. Okay. Where are you? Where are you? Um, who's first? Nelson. Nelson. Wilson. And Nelson. Oh, Emerson. And Nelson. Where were you? Yes, I, I was. Uh, uh, I'm from New Hampshire. Okay, New Hampshire. Right next to Connecticut. <laughs> I don't know where it is. Concord, New Hampshire, Portsmouth, New Hampshire. No, no, Nashua. Nashua. Nashua, New Hampshire, right on the border with Massachusetts. Uh-huh, not in the White Mountains. No, no, south, south, uh, oh, the okay. closest to Boston there is. Okay, the, by Portsmouth, yeah. Portsmouth. No, Portsmouth is, is uh, coast. Oh. It's yeah. uh, Hampton Beach right. and stuff like that. Okay, go ahead, I'm listening. Yeah, how you doing, Jacob? Uh, the reason, uh, per se, like I don't even- New York originally, am I got that wrong? No, Jersey? no, I, I'm originally from Brazil. I, oh, I was okay. brought to I was brought to America when I was thirteen. Okay. Uh, so it was not of my will. 
I was brought here and thank God I'm here. I'm blessed. Okay. What's the uh, question? I don't actually per se, I don't have a question. Uh, what I wanted to, you know, tell you is that I have a word from the Holy Spirit. Well, I have a word from the Holy Spirit, a what, message wait, 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 from wait, wait, God. Wait, 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 wait. To the remnant, to the remnant church. Uh, let me let me read a scripture here for you, one real quick, uh, just so you know where, where this is coming from. Uh, Luke ten, all right, and whosoever shall speak a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven, but unto that unto him that blaspheme against the Holy Spirit, it shall not be forgiven. And I'll, I'll even I'll even bring X five. Hey, listen, Safira. this is the kind of thing that we normally would put on the Facebook page. Not this is a question and answer time. No, if you yeah, have a question, this is not I'll a take question. It. Well, then so, you have to go to. The, I have to point you to the Facebook page. Okay, the listen, Facebook page is the platform for this. God, God sent me down here. God sent me to tell you that He has a word for the remnant church. Well, put, it on, is, the, put is, it on the Facebook I, page. This is a Q&A time. Listen, I need to I need to speak with you. I know, I know, I want to set up a time with you. This was for well, you. I, again, I have to appoint you. I can't make exceptions. This is a Q&A time. And then if somebody else has a word and somebody else please have a word. We have a for, forum for that, and that's the Facebook page. Please go there, and what you s present will be considered. No, I, I don't want to present it here. I want to ask you if you if you would like to receive it. If you well, look, I, I don't receive anything. We can anything. set up a time. I, I receive nothing. I test everything. If Amen. You so I note, I have a message for you to test. If you then put it on the Facebook page and I'll see it. Right. Amos, I have a question, please. Well, first of all, second question, but we have a few people ahead who have actually just put it through. But we'll, I will come back to you. Don't, don't worry. Um, we have a lot of questions which we want to get through, and we need to keep the questions specific to the actual subject matter in hand. That really is important because that's what the Lord has actually directed Jacob to bring tonight. And as much as we're not discounting what our brother says, but this isn't the the, 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 the platform to do that. So please don't feel discouraged, brother, about um, the fact that we don't want to bring what the Lord has laid on your heart tonight for the Holy Spirit, but we need to weigh that up and we need to test up. But specifically here tonight, we're dealing with questions in relation to teaching about Elijah and the relation of the end times. So don't feel discouraged, but please put it on the website or on the, on the Facebook page, on the group. Just go there and we can all weigh it up. And if necessary, we can shoot a fact over afterwards. So don't be put off. But I don't, I don't have, what, what group? I don't have Facebook. What, where else can I send this to you? I, you can send, send it to me. Hang on till the end. And you can send it to me. All right. All right. The All next right. person is Mika. Mika, good evening to you. It's your question. Where are you, Mika? Where? Hey, hey, Jacob. I'm Where from Kewa, Finland. Finland. Oh, Finland. Helsinki? No, no, no. It's the west coast of Finland. It's a small, small town called Teuva. Teuva in, in the Finland. West coast. Finland. I've only been to Finland yeah. one time. It was very interesting. Ah. <laughs> What do you like? How I liked it? Helsinki. It was an interesting city historically. But I knew a lot of believers from Finland and Israel. Yeah, there's there were a lot of believers who volunteer Christian organizations and things from Finland and Israel. What's your question, brother? Well, my question is about this Matthew 24 and, and 15. Uh, this because I have always think about what is this that Prophet Daniel is talking about the, the abom abomination okay. of desolation. Okay. And and how it and how it relates to this uh, verse uh, 30, 37 uh, about the times of Noah. Is there a correlation there also? Not a direct correlation to the times of Noah. No. We online on, on the website you will find our teaching on Hanukkah. On Hanukkah. And we deal with it on that. I also have a book called Shadows of the Beast. Shadows of the Beast, if you can read good English, and most people in Finland can. It's in that yeah, book yeah, and it's yeah. explained in great detail, great length. Okay? It has to do with 
something that already happened, but that's going to happen again. Okay? It comes from Daniel 11, but it's going to happen again. But it's a huge subject, and it's in the book Shadows of the Beast. But you Okay, Jacob, your line is just frozen temporarily. Yeah, fin Finnish is, is, a, is a cousin of of Hungarian, the experts say, but even, they don't yeah. even understand each other. Or Estonian also. Yes. Estonian. We're closer to Estonian than hung Hungarian. Closer to Estonian? Okay. Um, see, people in Finland, I, I know people from Finland who know English really, really well. And I know yeah. others who don't know it quite as well. So I don't yeah. know who you said. <laughs> Well, I, I, my wife is from Holland, and oh, okay, then she knows English good. The home language is basically English. Yeah, she, yeah. She, she knows English, and good. I'm an opera singer myself. So, yeah, Are I'm you? opera singer myself. So, yeah, I have to work with the languages all the time. I like the drinking song from La Traviata. <laughs> 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 That's right. That's pretty good. Yeah. What's your wife's name? Yeah. Your wife's name Alexandra. is Alexandra. Alexandra. Who had Alexandra. Alexandra. Who had? Thank you very much. Thank you, Welt. Ask believe. Where are you from in Holland? Where? Horten, Horten Hoof, uh, very close to Hilversum. Hilversum. Uh, Hilversum is maybe more known. It's a kind of a media town where there's lots of radio and television stuff. It's, it's, I only know Rotterdam, Amsterdam, Utrecht, place, Appledorn, places like that. Oh, everything, man. everything is so close in Holland. Yeah, 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 yeah. So. Ah, okay. Thank you, Feld. Okay. God, go to... Thank you, man. God bless you. Thank you, you so much. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Art Maria, you've got quite a, an involved question, Art. If you want to come with your question, Jacob, you may want to take a note mentally. If not, uh, script, scribble it down. Art, right, over to you. Okay. Yeah. I just, uh, Hey Jacob, this is Art from Washington state. Um, oh, Art it is? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, so in Malachi chapter four, right. we read that Elijah, the prophet will come before the great and terrible day of the Lord. Right. In Matthew 17, Jesus refers to his return future tense to Jesus and differentiates it from John the Baptist because right. some thought, that was, you know, a fulfillment. Correct. Um, do you discount the possibility of a literal physical return of Elijah the prophet? Not, and not and what, can, can you comment on the meaning of restoring all things? Okay. We have to go to what Elijah did and what John the Baptist did. The people in the days of Elijah himself when Jezebel and Ahab were around and the priests of Baal, they had lost sight of the basic truths of the Torah. He pointed people back to it. Okay. John the Baptist, although the son of a high priest, he went out into the wilderness because the Sanhedrin was so corrupt. He could have had a good position as, you know, in the Levitical priesthood, but he left it and he went out into the wilderness to teach the truth because the people had become so corrupt and the Sanhedrin had become so corrupt, okay? In the last days, the same thing happens. The church becomes so corrupt and Israel becomes so religiously corrupted, far from the word of God. Elijah is going to do what John did. Elijah to come now is going to do what John did and he's going to do what Elijah did. He's going to point people back to the word of God. That is why at the end of Malachi, it first talks about the Torah. Remember, keep the Torah of Moses. I'm going to send you Elijah. It puts it in the very next verse. Do you see that? Yep. That's the reason. He points people back. Now, there's something else that's curious. Uh, there's a place called Mykaitos, which is related to the Greek word blessing. And it was a fortress castle or fortress palace on the Dead Sea on the Jordan side, south of the mouth of the Jordan, but it was within the reign of Herod. That is where John the Baptist was beheaded. Um, but it is at the very foot 
of Haram Navo, where Moses died and is buried. So Moses is above on Haram Navo, Mount Nebo, and straight down Mount Nebo is where John the Baptist was killed in the shadow of the Torah, as it were. Uh, I, I believe there is a symbolic meaning or symbolic, uh, an illustration in that topography and geography. It's right under Haranavo, right under Mount Nebo, where Moses saw the land and died, <clears throat> and Joshua was commissioned, and would, where a lot, uh, John the Baptist in the spirit of Elijah was killed at the, almost at the foot of it, uh, between the foot of the mountain and the shore of the Dead Sea. Uh, you always see this connection between the Torah John pointed people back to the Torah. Um, now, to understand this a little bit further, remember they asked Jesus the question, and he said, let me ask you a question. Was the baptism of John from God or from man? Remember that? Yep. Well, that's important. What Jesus was saying is, if you can't believe the message of John, if you can't believe the Torah, <laughs> and John was the epitome of righteousness under the Torah, no man ever born was greater than John except for Jesus. If you can't accept the Torah, if you can't accept what John represented, you can't accept me. Another example of this is John 5. If you believed Moses, you'd believe me also. As we often point out, the problem of unsaved, unbelieving Jews is not that they don't believe in Jesus as the Messiah, that is the consequence of the problem. That is the result of the problem. Their rejection of Jesus is the result of the problem. But the problem is they don't believe Moses and the Torah. If they really believed Moses and the prophets and the Torah, they would believe that Jesus is the Messiah. Um, so you always see this Elijah pointing people back to the Torah, back to the word of God. What Elijah did, what John did, is what Elijah is going to do in the future. He's going to point people back to scriptural Christianity or <laughs> scriptural Judeo-Christian faith, as opposed to the uh, corruption of what's going to be popular Christendom. And of course, Judaism, which is rabbinic anyway. Does that make sense? Yeah, so are you saying that he... I mean, in what sense will he do that? Will he have, will it just be the, the spiritual condition uh, will be similar to that of the days of Elijah in the Old Testament? Or are you saying that there will be a present ministry or a future ministry actually on earth? There will be a future Elijah ministry on earth. The question is, will it be a literal return of Elijah himself because he was raptured? Or will it be as in John the Baptist, somebody in that character. I tend to believe it'll be Elijah himself, but it will still follow the same pattern. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Interesting, interesting subject, and probably we could spend another hour discussing it, but thank you for that question, Art. It's really important. Mika, can you just send me back a response to the message I've just posted you? Beryl Hunter, who's on, on the group tonight, Meryl, Meryl, Beryl looks after the Moriel distribution of Moriel books and publications, etc. She's going to send you a copy of the, the Beast of uh, Jacob, as Jacob mentioned in his little chat with you. It will be a, a blessing. Just send me your email address. I'll put you and Beryl in contact with each other, and she'll arrange to send that out to you. I just, I just send it. Yes. Fantastic. Bless you, brother. I'll pass that on to thank Beryl. Thank you. Thank you. That to come out to you, Christoph. You're next, brother. Thank you so much, Jacob, for today and for your patience and, and your love. Actually, short question. Elijah, the uh, Tish, uh, Tishbite? Yeah. Do you see any cor correlation with uh, Tishba'af, the day of destroying of uh, the temple? No, no, it's it's different. Okay, thank you. Okay. Short and sweet question. Well done. Uh, Rachel, you've been hanging on. Rachel, good evening to you. It's your turn for a question. Rachel, are you still there? Yeah, it's not Rachel, it's her husband, if that's okay. We're that's absolutely right. fine by us. We've got no dis discrimination here, brother. 
Good show. Um, Jacob, two of the passages you highlighted in your introduction, one was about being dressed and ready for service, and the other one was about when Jesus sends out the 12. Yes. When, when he sends out the 12, he tells them not to take a certain things with them, like a cloak, money, etc., etc. Right. Se second temple period, Jews going up to worship on the temple, man, wouldn't have been allowed to carry those things. Correct. Is that right? They would have had to go. That is correct. Yeah. And then the bit, being, the bit about being dressed, dressed and ready, which must have a correlation to not losing the garments of salvation. Exactly. The, the, as I understand it, the, 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 the captain of the guard in the temple would have um, would have set fire to the linen tunic of a, a guard found sleeping. So yeah. all these things have got like a, a very strong temple motif to them. Is yes. It, is it well, simply accentuating the passage? Are, yeah, on you go. Edersheim wrote about those things you're talking about. Alfred Edersheim, The Life and Times of Jesus the Messiah. Yeah. That's the main work we have dealing with these things. But go ahead. Is it So is it just accentuating to us um, what our attitude should be in service to Christ? Or am I missing something in the passage that's deeper okay. than that? There's another place where Jesus says, bring two swords. Remember? Sounds what like my sword. Bye. Yeah. Now, the two swords, of course, represent the Old and New Testament. You know, the yeah. sort of the word, yeah. the word like this. Okay. So, yeah, there's there is a fig, obviously a figurative meaning to it. Um, the first thing it tells us is something that we see with in one of the epics of King David in the Old Testament is because God leads in a certain way in one situation, do not assume He's going to lead you the same way in a second situation. Uh, oh, we don't need any, uh, you know, money. We don't need any. We just go by faith out into the mission field and preach. Well, when the Lord tells you to do that, do that. But there'll be other times he won't tell you to do that. He will tell you to be financially prepared to expect what you need to expect and things like that. That is the first thing it teaches. The second thing it teaches, though, is when you look at it from the point of view of the last days. The final church will have to hold things loosely. We won't... It, the things you own wind up o owning you if you're yeah, not yeah. careful. Like Lot's yeah. wife, she looked back, remember? That he was in the field, not go back for his cloak. Remember? Don't no. look back. We have to have that attitude. I'm just going to trust the Lord and I'm going to do what he tells me. And I don't care about the material or financial realities. When he tells you to do that. Sure. But it must be the leading of the spirit and that situation. Okay. You're in Ireland? No, we're in Scotland. Oh, Scotland. Okay. Uh, it's all right. I'm not insulted. <laughs> That's a night. Now we're here. Where are you in Scotland? Uh, we're on the northwest coast up near the Isle of Skye. Oh, boy, you're really up there. It must, must be cold up there already, really cold. Yeah, yeah, it's barely <laughs> been about freezing for the last week. Yeah. Thank Fantastic. you so much for joining us. Thank you very much for that. Guys, we're going to hand yeah. over back to Susan. Susan, good evening to you. You've got a question. Susan, are you still there? Going once, going twice. No, Susan. Terry, Terry, good evening. Yes, Oh, there you are. Susan, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> yes, sorry. I had to unmute. No, it's okay. It's a delay. Where sometimes. are you, Susan? Where are you? <laughs> I'm in New York City. All right. Hey, make me homesick already. <laughs> no, you don't want to be here. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I definitely don't. Um, my question to you is, I know that we, you spoke a lot on Elijah, but where is Elijah now these days? Where is the spirit of Elijah these days? Okay, Elijah himself is in heaven. He was raptured. Okay, the spirit of Elijah. Okay. <laughs> the spirit of Elijah. The spirit of Elijah, although many people claim to have it, they don't. It is not active at the present time. It will be active for three and a half years when it happens. Oh, wow. Okay. okay. All right. Where do you think that we are right now in the book of Revelation? No, but we're getting very close to it, to the beginning of birth pangs. Oh, wow. Okay, we're getting close. Right. To it. What, what, Thank I, you, Jacob. Okay. Thank you, Susanna. Um, Jacob, just on that, often people look 
at the two witnesses and they also look at Elijah or the spirit of Elijah. And we've seen that previously with John the Baptist, who was in the spirit of Elijah. People sometimes say that perhaps one of the witnesses might be Elijah. Where do you stand on that? Again, there's a, I, I, as I mentioned, there's a good case for that. Yeah. But the question is, is the other one Moses or is it other one Enoch? Or in, in the Middle East, a lot of Christians believe it is the Apostle John. Okay. I won't point to it now. Interesting stuff. Eric, you've been waiting patiently. Good evening to you again. Are you Good still evening. there, Eric? Yes, I'm still here. Good Bless evening. you, brother. Good to see you again. Bless you. Thank you, Jacob, for the message today. Um, Thank you, Eric. Given given the, the fact you have said that um, Jeremiah's time and Elijah's time, uh, the context of, of the background. And Daniel's. Of, and Daniel's. And Daniel, the cultural context that they uh, were living in. Oh, the historical is, context. Historical. historical context. Okay. And that they were living in, that it's going to be somewhat the way we're going to be living in. Correct. As the church, the body of Christ, some of those prophets, I, I know Jeremiah didn't have great success from a standpoint of numbers. A lot of people rejected his message, but it happened. Um, right. He was just obedient. But Daniel had some success when he was serving in the court of Nebuchadnezzar. And Elijah has some success when he slayed the, the prophets of, of, of Baal and he was able to call down fire from heaven when he was obedient to God. How do we, how do we understand within the, the ecclesia, the church now, given the time we're in, is the Lord going to grant us the, power, the, the charismatic power, again, like in the book of Acts, to go out into the highways and byways and... and be able to call lost souls again back into the house of the Lord. The Scripture, faith, the faithful church, yes, but the highways and byways bit that is becoming questionable. <clears throat> um, don't forget, it says the eternal gospel is preached from the air in Revelation. What is that? Is it satellite communications? I don't know, but I wouldn't go with the highways and byways bit. But the faithful church will continue to preach the gospel. While it is light, night will come when no man can work. After that, things change. Okay, so we're close. We're we're somewhere in between that work while it's light and. That is correct. That, that is exactly is correct. correct. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Eric. Good question, Andreas. You're next. Okay. Hello. Good evening, Andreas. You hear me, Andreas? Where are you? Greece or? In oh. Poland. Zoomie Popolsko. <laughs> okay. You know, yes, you, know this guy? you know this guy? I? Tote, yes, Tote. Do you know this guy? This other ah. Do you know him? No, I, I, I moved to Poland a few months ago. I'm oh. not Polish. Oh, where, where are you from? Um, a double citizenship, Swiss and Israeli. Oh, Swiss and... Oh, at the end of the day, right? Behlet. נפגשנו בקהילת תור השרון בנתניה. אתה מאמין יהודי? כן. בסדר. איפה אתה באת לאמונה? בארץ או בגלות? בארץ, בבית ההורים. בבית ההורים. נצרת עילית. בסדר, טוב, טוב מאוד. איזה שאלה, מה השאלה שלך? Ask in English if you can. So, I will do it in English. Okay. Or in Swiss German. No, I will do it in English. Yeah, I... to teach you. <laughs> so um, I've thought about um, Daniel 12, verse 1. You read it, and um, I would really be um, interested to, to hear your opinion in the angel um, Michael, um, specifically his action, What? What? why is he mentioned there, uh, what is his um, role in this verse. Um, and to specifically also in regard to the um, to the verb, the imperfect verb, um, Yamod. Yamod, um, yeah. yeah. He shall stand. Yes, it does not say Yakum, and I see that um, some English translation has um, yeah, a means he shall, Yakum, is, I had to translate for the people. Yakum means he shall raise up. Oh, go ahead, I'm listening. Okay. First no, of all, I, I'm now listening. <laughs> the book of Daniel shows us there's a correlation between the spiritual battles in the heavenlies and the battles on earth. Okay? Yes, Kesher, Gamyas Tsel, 
בעולם על מה שיש באיזה קרב בשמיים בין מיכאל וסטן וזה אותו דבר בעולם. It's the same thing, one reflects the other. There's a connection between the spiritual battles in the heavenlies and the battles on earth. This comes into play most strongly in Daniel chapter 10 with the principalities, the demonic powers over Iran. Iran become a threat to Israel's existence. The battles we see now and the strategic threat to Israel from Iran is not purely strategic or military or political. There are demonic powers on back of this. There is a battle taking place in the heavenlies. The book of Revelation tells us that Michael eventually throws Satan out of the present heaven and he comes to earth. When that happens, he will physically inhabit the Antichrist who will become virtually Satan incarnate. That is the role of Michael. Angels do what they've always done. For instance, Gabriel, Gabriel, the mighty one of God. He is showing Daniel about the coming of the Messiah. And so that same Gabriel comes to Miriam, to Mary, the mother of Jesus, and tells her about the coming of the Messiah. Gabriel does what he always does. Michael does what he always does. The angels always have the same... They always do the same stuff. Okay, uh, what, what Daniel is saying is the battles we see in Israel strategically threatening Israel's existence are reflections of a battle taking place in the heavenlies. Satan must try to destroy Israel and the Jews for the same reason he must try to destroy the true church. The return of Yeshua depends on God's prophetic purposes for the true church, and it depends on God's prophetic purposes for Israel and the Jews. Satan must try to destroy both of them. It is a conflict that we see physically, politically, legally, strategically, but it is a reflection of a greater conflict happening in heaven spiritually. Does that make sense? אתה רוצה שאני אסביר בעברית או? לא, אני אנדרסטוד. אני אוקיי עם האנגלית. אוקיי. יש את היידיש גם כן, הבסלה. מאנה דויטש יודנדויטש. מאנה דויטש יודנדויטש. אם אני אנדרסטנד... אם אני אנדרסטנד פוליש, גרמן ותיברו, אני אוקיי עם היידיש, אבל אני לא יודע ללמוד יידיש. כן. כשאני בסוויסרלנד, They talk to me in Swiss or I answer in Yiddish and they understand me. All right. Mm -hmm. Another Good rabbi, Vin and Dank, uh, Andreas. Okay, folks, can we just uh, quickly say hello to people Thank on the live stream? A lot of you are trying to connect with us tonight to ask some questions on Zoom. Unfortunately, we have had to stop your access coming on. And I know there's, I'm probably batting away 40 or 50 people here at the minute. And we do apologize if you're watching on the RTN or on the Morel TV. live stream and you're trying to come into the zoom meeting to ask questions i've had to restrict it because we had issues earlier on tonight and we don't want to run the risk of any more disruptions so we do apologize this isn't the normal way we like to do business here at moriel but unfortunately we've had to do it tonight because we have a few interlopers who've caused a few problems so if you do have questions still please go to the online bible study facebook page we have a group there if you want to ask questions please put your questions there and join that group where we can take part and help the discussion afterwards. We can't take anybody else from the live stream, either on Moriel or on YouTube tonight. We're really going to take a few more questions um, because we had the delay earlier on. We're going to run over a little bit of extra time, as it were, but we're now down to our last four or five questions. But this is a really important subject. I don't want to lose any of your trains of thought or where you're going with this. So we're now going to go to Israel, keeping it Hebraic. Israel, good evening to you. <laughs> How are you doing, Jacob? Uh, I'm doing well. I just have a quick question. I'm actually, in, we met one time in 2019. I'm actually from Israel. I'm a Puerto Rican from New York City, uh, living currently in Las Vegas. The way it's going to be around my head, Rano. Get that bien? Bien, todo bien, gracias. Yeah, I met, I met you one time with my son, and uh, it was entertaining. You started singing some old songs I haven't heard in a long time. Donde? Where are you? Okay. Donde? We... Um, 
we met up in in an area close to Charlotte in 2019. Okay. You were visiting then a church. Okay. Um, so my question is, um, uh, I mean, really seeing and understanding what's going on and how the scriptures are really coming alive and uh, really opened my eyes. I saw an article um, from the Daily Wire, uh, just people responding to Joe Biden and how he, people are just saying that he's uh, the most humble religious man, yeah, uh, president that came and how he's going to bring Christian, um, a little bit of Christianity yep. into this whole new, new world. And yep. it, it, the question is, is and, and I've seen in scripture, we see it from how the Pharisees use the Roman Empire as their right hand of enforcing the things that they would even do. Um, how critical would that be seeing how liberal Christianity, what we see now in Hillsong and all these churches, um, really using the arm of the president to really in, uh, restrain true Christianity. Absolutely. That, well, Martin Luther King's uh, niece, who's a Christian, warned about Raphael Warnock, who stands on Martin Luther King's pulpit. And he said, she said, he has nothing to do with Martin Luther King. His radical position against abortion is an atro atrocity. Okay, but he's an example of, of, of a liberal, of somebody who's theologically liberal, who's, who, who's going to do exactly as you say. But there are, will, will be evangelicals who will certainly compromise with it. This is without question. Yesterday, Biden's priest, when he went to Mass, was the first Catholic Mass he attended as, a, as, a, as president, the priest did not deal with the radical pro-abortion position of Biden, which the Catholic Church is officially against. He instead denounced Trump for not being pro-life because Trump would not condemn capital punishment. <laughs> what a deal with the fact that Biden's a baby killer. I mean, it's the unbelievable hypocrisy of the Roman Church, but that's the Roman Church. The liberal Protestants, that's the liberals. My problem is when it comes in among people professing to believers, and you've already seen the trend towards it with people like Tim Keller. Great, great. Thank you. No, I appreciate it. I, I've, I've definitely seen it. And, uh, and just another, just a just quick question after that. How does Matthew 10, 8 kind of fall into place towards the end time where the Antichrist will and the followers will try to kind of manipulate Jambres and Jambres, a lot of the, just the, you know, the powers that, and the miracles that the uh, disciples, that Jesus gave to the disciples. Okay, I, you say Matthew ten eight. I think don't you mean in Timothy? Um, I think it was the one that he gave them just the to go out there and raise the dead, heal the sick. No, Jonathan John <laughs> for in Timothy. Paul names them. Oh, okay, the, yes, they're Pharaoh's magicians. The way Pharaoh's magicians counterfeited the miracles of Moses and Aaron is a foreshadow of the way the Antichrist and false prophet are going to counterfeit the miracles of Jesus and his witnesses. You understand? The pictures of the Antichrist and false prophet, Jonathan and John. Yes. Ray. And it's, it's in Timothy, uh, First Timothy 3, I think. Um, it's not in Matthew 10. Your okay. name is Timothy. Oh, great. Thank you so much. God Thank you very much, Israel. We're going to go to David Van Steinvik next, and then after that, we'll be going straight in, go straight in to uh, Peter McIntyre. So, Peter, you will follow David. David, uh, you hey. Too? Uh, good evening, guys. Um, good evening, Jake. Jake. Where are you, Holland? Um, <laughs> my family's from Washington, uh, oh. but we're currently in the Philippines. Okay, where are you um, in the Philippines? Uh, Davao City, uh, in the oh, south. Okay, we have a we have our mission in Olongapo. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, I just have a really quick question uh, yeah. concerning. Uh, <laughs> the ministry and the spirit of Elijah uh, Elijah, as the days, Elijah. Uh, Elijah sorry. Okay. Um, because what I understand is that as the days apostate and the church gets more fragmented, hopefully um, the spirit of Elijah comes through. My question is, um, will the spirit of Elijah uh, be during 
or I mean, would it come before the rapture? Um, because as I read Revelation 6 and 11, it seems yeah, that the two witnesses... Is more likely the key. Okay. Okay. Because Revelation 11 is more likely the key. Okay. Uh, my, my question here is because when I read uh, Revelation 11, and there is a strong case for one of the witnesses being Elijah. Yes, correct. I was wondering is uh, because I learned that from the sixth and the seventh seal and somewhere in between there is when the church, the faithful correct. church at least, gets exactly correct. Uh, raptured out. Exactly so I'm wondering correct. is will we uh, see the ministry of Elijah or the two witnesses or is that for Israel only? Okay. Let Thank you. Explain. Let me explain. The structurally, in the literary structure of Revelation, the sets of seven are always sequential. The sixth trumpet follows the fifth, you know, the fourth seal follows the third. The, you know, the seventh trumpet follows the sixth. It's always sequential, okay? Now, you have seven churches, seven peals of thunder that people overlook, seven seals, seven trumpets, and the seven vials, okay? You got five major sets of seven, okay? Now, they're sequential. So because it is between the sixth and seventh, it is in the sequence, okay? It is in that sequence. We can pinpoint it to that time. This is not to say that they may not have been active previously in some way. It is just to say that the culmination of their ministry will take place between the sixth and seventh seal. Now, after that, chapter 12 reverts. It goes back and tells the same story from a different perspective and keeps on going until you get to chapter 16. But pay attention. There's always an interlude between the sixth and seventh seal. During that interlude is the rapture. Okay. The trumpets between the sixth and seventh trumpet is an interlude. That's where the two mm. witnesses come into play. I see. Okay. The interludes are always important in the sets of seven. We have a book called Harpezo, and I go into it in greater length. Um, I'm not trying to make a sale, but if you read the book, we try to explain it. But thank you for your question. Does that clear things up a bit? Yes. Uh, God bless. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Oh, you're, are your parents missionaries? Uh, no. Uh, we just kind of moved here. <laughs> okay. Another question, please. No more questions. I get to I, have an alcohol-free beer and go to sleep. <laughs> Peter McIntyre, you're up next. Was that? Peter McIntyre. Peter McIntyre, you're next. If he's still there. If not, then Eric Fernandez again. You asked me a question, Eric? Yes, Jacob, really quickly. In Matthew 24 in the Olivet Discourse, in, in verse 15, when Jesus is referring to the abomination of desolation, the, the verses before that refer to the church age, correct? The church age, use that term. Most people think the church age means before the, what is before the rapture, okay? Yep. The church age will end before that. It will only be individual believers the way it was before Pentecost. Okay. You understand? The way this is in the book, the Harpezo. So you, you, the, belief, the believers will still be here. The believers will still be here. But it's not, per se, strictly part of the church age. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does, because when I see, it does, uh, and I'm probably going to pick up the book Harpezo just yes. to get a, a deeper understanding of it, because when I see from the, from verses 15 through 20, uh, 
22, it's yeah. very Jewish. It talks about the Sabbath. It talks about uh, the abomination of desolation, which has to do with the third temple. But you're yeah. saying that Christians will still be here to see that happen. Christians will definitely see the Antichrist okay. and definitely see the abomination of desolation before the rapture. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Eric. You're very welcome. Folks, a few of you have been asking about Morial publications, some of Jacob's books, etc. We don't normally um, push them or try and promote them, but you have been asking. If Beryl is still there, Beryl, can you just come on the line just for a, sec a quick second and explain to people if they want to get some of the publications the best and easiest way of doing it? Beryl Hunter, if you're there, Beryl. No, Beryl's gone. Okay. Let's go to moriel.org, moriel.org, and go on to the web store, whatever it is, and order it. Okay. Moriel.org is the easiest way. Moriel.org. You'll see the shop on there with various publications and things where you can avail themselves. There's also a stream on Amazon. I don't know the difference in price if there is one, but there's also there as well. Okay. We're going to head over to Terry. Terry Mulholland. Good evening. Okay. <laughs> Hi, Jacob. Hello. Uh, I'm in Dallas, Texas, actually north of there uh, in Frisco. Um, I wanted to go back to some of the stuff you talked about at the beginning about the falling away, and we're left with a remnant. Yes. When people, when people fall away, have, were they ever saved in the sense of written in the Book of Life, and they've been now made a choice? The reason I'm asking is, should we make an effort to try to bring them back. Okay. This is not really the subject tonight, but I'll answer your question in a concise manner. I can't go, uh, elaborate in length because it's a separate subject. It's okay if you gotta, we got to go. It's, I can cover oh, it another time. A, you cannot backslide unless you front slid, okay? When you have somebody who falls away, it presupposes that they were there to begin with. An unrepentant backslider does not have the assurance of salvation. They need to repent. And we should pray for them and try to get them back, but the Lord tries to get them back as well. The Lord will even bring calamity into their life to get them to repent before it's too late. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, you had somebody who was into really gross immorality, seriously gross immorality of an incestuous nature with his father's wife. And Paul says even the pagans wouldn't do this. This is completely perverse and so on. Paul says, I've given such a one over to Satan, as the Lord led him to do it, that his soul may be saved. God will bring a judgment on an unrepentant backslider to scare them into repentance before it's too late. When you have a backslider, you've got two kinds of approaches. A Calvinistic person will just say, oh, they were never saved to begin with. They may be right. A Wesleyan Armenian person, following John Wesley and Armenian, take that view, would say, maybe you're correct. Maybe they were never saved to begin with. But they're not saved now. We both agree they're not saved now. So the Calvinist agrees they're not saved now, and the Wesleyan Armenian believes they're not saved now. The issue of were they ever saved to begin with or not is tertiary. You understand? Uh, okay. It does not have to bring the amount of division that it has theologically, but it does bring a lot of practical division. Backsliders have left not the church, they've left Jesus. Amen. Um, and they need to repent. Folks, I'm just going to try and rush the questions forward a bit. We've got three or four left, and we've got very little time. We're going to go to Marty. Marty, good evening to you. You have a question? Yes, yes. Uh, uh, hello, uh, hello, brother Jacob. Hello, brother Amos. First of all, thank you? you. Where are you located? Uh, I am located in Germany, but I'm originally from Iran. I come from Iran with my family. All right. Yeah. So, Brother Jacob, I really want to thank you uh, for uh, this time that you have given us. Uh, it was really a blessing. And my question is, uh, Brother Jacob, looking at the events that you're talking about and 
of course, the events that uh, you today were talking about specifically, and seeing how all these things are speeding up in how they're happening. Is it then, uh, with the, all the things that are happening around us, it's good to, pers uh, to think that the persecution of church in a worldwide level is going to return back to us, to Bible-believing Christians and the faithful church? Too? What happens in Iran, in Isfahan, or in Qom, or Tehran to Christians, will happen in the West? The answer is absolutely yes. Jesus said you'll be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Are you saved out of Shia Islam? Are you a former Shia or were you an Iranian Christian? Um, no, I never was a Christian uh, in Iran. After I moved to Germany, I became a Christian. But okay. I used to be called a Shia Muslim. You were Shia. Okay, praise God. I've known other Shias who have gotten saved. Yes. Thank God you came to faith in Jesus. No, Where good question, Marty. Where were you in Germany? Um, excuse me, uh, can you um, repeat the question? Wer in Deutschland, bitte? Um, it is summer, I don't know. I believe in the west of, uh, of the Germany. We moved here recently, so I don't know exactly where it is located, but it is called Munchen Gladbach. Okay. okay. Thanks, Marty. Good to see you. We'll hopefully see you again in the future. Amal, Amal, you've been waiting patiently. Good evening to you. Um, hi, Jacob. Hi, Amal. Where are um, you based, please? I'm from Nashville, Tennessee. Okay. Yeah. Um, quick question. Um, you know, you mentioned about um, the name of God. Yes. Uh, well, um, you know, uh, well, people call uh, him by Yahweh, by Jehovah, by Yari yes. Wahweh, and scholars even debate what his actual name is. And when I pray, I, I don't use his name. I always pray to the Heavenly Father in the name of Jesus Christ. Okay. But here's my question that Jesus himself never called him by name, but only addressed him as my father. So why are we addressing him by name? Okay. Let me answer your question. Are you saved out of Islam? Are you... Are you, are you um, from no, I was, I was always a, a Christian. Yeah, I was in a, from a Christian family, but I'm originally from India. Okay, oh, you're from India, okay. Yeah. Okay. First of all, you are correct in what you say in the gospel narratives. Jesus referred to him as my father who is in heaven, okay? But he also used the Greek term theo, which means God, okay? He used the term theo, which is just the, the generic term for God. In the book of Revelation, however, in the book of Revelation, we see something different. When Jesus came to earth, God became a man. That's known as the Son of Man. On earth, he's always the Son of Man, when Son of Man comes. In heaven, he's always the Son of God, okay? John the Apostle knew Jesus as a man. But when he saw him in his deity, in John and Revelation chapter 1, he had a conniption, remember? You understand what I'm saying? Um, you understand what I'm saying? Um, yeah, I'm actually looking at Revelation 2. Okay. Now, that when John saw Jesus... On the Lord's Day, he fell as if slain. He was knocked out. Now, he knew Jesus as a man. But when he saw Jesus as God, it was completely different. Jesus identifies himself in verse 8 as the Alpha and Omega. Yeah. First and last, beginning and end. And he will be Alab and Tav. What you seem to be doing, Amal, and I'm trying to figure out what, what you're doing, I think what you're doing is you are confusing the name of the Father with the name of God. <laughs> Yehovah, Yahweh, is not the name of the Father. It's the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Okay? Okay. You, you are misapplying him as Father. 
Yeah, you, you, you think that's the name of the father. They're, well, they're, they're, Abba, that's his name. He, he's the father. But, but that's yeah. not Yahweh. He, the father is one of the persons of Yahweh. Okay. You so understand? Yahweh is like a, like Trinity. Yes, yeah, try yeah. right. all, right. all right. All right. Okay. Cool. Thanks. Thanks for that. Okay. Another question. One more question. Then I'm going to get my alcohol free beer. Going once, hey, going cool. twice. Oh, hey, yes. Hi. Um, Hi. Monica, Monica, where are yeah. you? Um, I'm in North Wales, but I'm from Poland. Elizabeth uh, okay. And, yeah. and my husband is from Scotland. Jesus loves them anyway. <laughs> where are you? Bangor and Landuna, where are you? Um, Mold. Okay. What yeah, is your question? Chester. Yeah, oh, yeah, trust you're over, over that way, by Queen yeah. Sarah, you know that. I... Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, okay, um, what's your question? So my question is um, about two witnesses. Um, in our church recently, we received a teaching saying that uh, those two witnesses are uh, two temples. Uh, and have you ever came across teaching like that? Yes. Uh, there are people who do things like that. One is that says this, that they're the Old and New Testament. The Seventh Day Adventists play games like that. Okay, um, these two witnesses are killed and they raise from the dead the way Jesus did on the third day. Um, they're not buildings; they're actual people. Mm -hmm. The teaching is—I don't know what church you go to, but the teaching is mistaken. It's not right. Okay. Well, it's evangelical. Is it FIEC? FI, yeah. Oh, well, FIEC, you know, there's good ones and there's ones that aren't so good. They're, you can't really say, I know ones that are pretty good and I know ones that aren't too good. But um, the teaching is not correct. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks, okay. Thank, Thank you, Monica. Okay. We're going to go over now to, where is the name has gone? David Cronin. David Cronin, you've got the penultimate question tonight, David. Where are you uh, based, David? What's that, Jacob? Where are you located? In New Haven. New Haven, Connecticut. Yeah. Okay. Um, you were talking about the uh, Jezebels in the church, and right. you were talking about the feminism with the generation gap, with feminism probably coming in, and exactly how much leeway do women have in the church to teach or preach or... Women can be deaconesses, first of all. Secondly, let the older women teach the younger. Nobody says that women cannot have a leadership ministry and a teaching ministry to other women, okay? But the senior leadership of a church in the pastoral ministry and teaching doctrine to mixed congregations must be male. But women can have teaching ministries to other women. Now, this is not to say women cannot share testimonies or encouragements or, or even give an evangelistic presentation. This is not to say that. It is just to say that women's teaching ministry is for women, women's leadership is for women, but the overall leadership of the church is male. The problem we have in large part is not the fault of the women. It's the fault of the men for not taking responsibility, but that's another issue. Now, there's another act dimension to this. The wife is the helpmeet. It is a very foolish Christian man, indeed, who does not give careful weight to the advice and counsel of a praying wife. Not a nagging wife, but a praying wife. Women can generally hear from the Lord easier than men. They can also be spiritually seduced easier than men. That's one of the reasons leadership is male. But women are more sensitive. When a husband and wife pray for direction, it's usually the wife who hears from the Lord first. When a couple gets saved, if the wife gets saved first, her husband might not get saved. There's some godly women with unsaved husbands for years, decades. But if the husband gets saved first, the wife usually gets saved. Usually, not always, but usually. Why is it easier for women to get saved? Usually. 
Why is it that women can hear the voice of the Holy Spirit more easily? Because the fall has affected men and women differently. Men have become insensitive. Women have become hypersensitive. So while it is easier for men, um, while it is easier for women to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit, it is also easier for women to hear the voice of a counterfeit spirit and be misled. What we might say is this, the male antenna is too short. It doesn't get the signal, but when it gets it, it's usually the right one. The female antenna is too long. It picks up all kinds of signals, sometimes even two contradictory signals at the same time, and they try to make sense of it somehow. Uh, the leadership must be male. But women are reliant on male protection. Men are reliant on female sensitivity. If a Christian, particularly one in ministry or leadership, has a wife who's a woman of prayer, she should be his number one counselor. She is his helpmeet. He's a very foolish man if he doesn't pay attention to her, at least carefully weigh what she says. She's the helpmeet. She exercises her, it's like the opposite. With Ahab and Jezebel, okay, Ahab is in submission to Jezebel. In a Christian marriage, it's the opposite. But they're still a team, <laughs> okay? Does that help? Yeah, that makes sense. That really does make sense. You're not in that skull and crossbones up there, are you, New Haven? I'm about five miles from there. <laughs> <laughs> I used to walk by it every night, walking out of the bars down there. Next time you'd go by, throw a hand grenade for me, will you? I'm <laughs> joking. David, thank you for your question. We were going to have a question from Phoebe, but I think Phoebe has now logged off. So, Phoebe, God bless you. Thank you anyway for, for standing out for the rest of the evening. A lot of people have been trying to ask questions tonight. We can't manage all of them, but we do thank you for hanging on tonight. We wouldn't normally go on this long, but a lot of the questions I thought we needed to answer. So thank you, Jacob, as well. You are running dry. Um, Beryl has sent me a question. I've just posted her email address on the chat below. If anybody does want to purchase any Moriel books or whatever, you'll see um, Beryl's email address at the bottom of the screen. Just drop Beryl a line and she will get that posted out to you. Some books... Um, we have limited copies left, others that they're, they're sufficient, but it may be in some cases first come, first serve. Jacob, before we close tonight, next week we're going to continue with this theme on yes. Elijah. Just give us a little press of what we're going to expect next week. We'll be looking at <coughs> Elijah himself and his conflict on Mount Carmel next week. Um, it's, it's an old teaching that we did, but it's been um, um, upgraded uh, in light of the current situation. So it'll, yeah. be, it'll be the, the conflict on Mount Carmel. That'll be next week. Fantastic. That'll be 7 o'clock here again on RTN, on the Zoom page, live on Moriel TV, and, of course, on uh, Moriel and uh, live stream with RTN as well. If we do decide to send out um, an, an encrypted access code to the Zoom page, we can only do that to those of you who are subscribing to RTN. So for those who want to take part in future programs, future um, Bible studies, go along to rtntv.org and subscribe, and then we can get you added to the mail list. And if we do decide because of disruptions tonight to actually go with a separate code every week, that's how we'll actually contact you with the code. That may well be the case, but I don't want to preempt it. Finally, we go back to the Maxwells. Maxwells, you've got the final question of the evening. Uh, I'm sorry to disappoint. Sorry, you've been answered. <laughs> Go on, you got a question. Um, the, the, the chap from the Philippines has already uh, asked it, so it's been answered. Oh, okay. fantastic. You can't get okay. much better than that. Let's, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your blessings and goodness. I pray that you will put your blessing on every person who listened tonight, that they will weigh carefully in the light of your word, prayerfully, everything that I've said, and that you would use these things to build your son's body in these last days. We also pray for those hackers, Lord. We know they're used by Satan. We know they're unsaved. We know that, that they're heading to hell. 
I pray, Lord God, that you will bring them a conviction of sin and put witnesses in their path before it is too late. For we know your judgment and wrath will be upon them if they don't repent and believe the gospel. We do pray for their salvation and protect our future webcast, Lord God, from this kind of interference. We know it comes from Satan. And we thank you, Lord God, that at least we're being somehow effective. Otherwise, he wouldn't bother us. Praise your name, Lord God. In the name of Jesus, keep us. Amen. Amen to that. Bless you all. We'll see you again next Saturday, next Saturday, next Wednesday, 7 o'clock UK time here on RTN TV with the Online Bible Study. Bless you, Jacob. Good night, everybody. Take care. Bye.